Hi everybody, welcome to another story time with Sid. It is me, Sydney of Hightower, as it is every week, and here we are again with another story. I should really say another series of stories, because now that I'm in this book, it's it's more than one story, but you know, semantics. So, this is going to be part two of this chapter of American Folklore, which is the Southerners. As I talked in my previous video, some of these stories might need caveats. Um, I know that some in this particular section um, do you have accents? I will not be reading in the accent, um, but yeah, so here we go. I think we should just dive in and get started. This first story, this first story, because I already scanned it because I was very excited. This first story I think a lot of you are going to appreciate. It's very sad, but if you are a history nerd or if you're a musical theater nerd, I think you'll recognize some of the figures in this particular story. This is called Alas for Theodosia. There is no more striking and tragic figure in American history than Aaron Burr. Almost elected president in 1800, he was shortly to be hated as the killer of Hamilton and tried for treason for plotting against the United States. Tragic, too, was the fate of his daughter, Theodosia, when, aged 29, she mysteriously vanished while on her way to meet Burr in New York. This account of her disappearance and its sequels is taken from Archibald Rutledge's From the Hills to the Sea. The long, low beaches that lie between the sounds of the North Carolina coast and the ocean itself were called by the Native Americans the Out Islands. Perhaps no other region of America is more filled with legends, more replete with history and mystery. All of these stories, none is more strange and appealing than that of the beautiful Theodosia Burr. Her father was Aaron Burr, once Vice President of the United States and notorious as the killer of Alexander Hamilton in a duel, and a man of overweening ambition who plotted and schemed with Blennerhazet to divide America, founding a separate empire of the West. At this time in history, 1810, the state of South Carolina was important in national elections, and Aaron Burr arranged, arranged a marriage between his daughter Theodosia and Governor Joseph Alston of Palmetto State. Tradition tells us that her real love was a great explorer, Met Meriwether Lewis. Joseph Alston took his bride to the Alston Plantation near the coast between Georgetown and Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. From the south end of the gardens were steps leading down to a landing on the Waccamaw River, whence a 15-mile trip south to Georgetown could easily be made by boat. Theodosia made this journey to board a vessel in Georgetown for New York, where she was to visit her father. On a little pilot boat called the Patriot, she is supposed to have sailed from Georgetown on December 30th, 1812. It was strange that Governor Alston would entrust his wife on that long and perilous voyage in such a vessel, or Aaron Burr would have permitted such a perilous journey. Apparently, Theodosia was the only real passenger, but it is said that her physician and her maids accompanied her. To be truthful, we do not really know how many souls were aboard that little packet, which was not really a seaworthy ship for an ocean voyage. When we read that Theodosia Burr, Alston, northbound, left on a packet named the Patriot just after Christmas in the year of 1812, we at once encounter a dilemma. We discover that there is no record of a vessel named the Patriot. Indeed, there is no record of any vessels having left Georgetown for New York on the day of the heroine was supposed to have sailed. Neither the beautiful Theodosia nor anyone else on the ill-fated vessel was ever seen again. When in those days a vessel disappeared, as vessels did with gruesome secrecy, the vanishing was attributed either to pirates or storms. Years later, in faraway Michigan, a dying man in an almshouse confessed rather incoherently that he was one of the members of a pirate crew who captured and robbed the Patriot. With a rather startling emphasis, he told the heroism of a very beautiful young woman. She pleaded tearfully and declared for the safety of the crew, at the same time promising that none of the buccaneers would be prosecuted. But her eloquent pleas were in vain. And when she realized the hard-heartedness of her captors, she walked the fatal plank with more fortitude than did any of the similarly doomed men. Could this heroine have been the lovely Theodosia? The legend of her fate had cast upon in the dim light of tradition when two condemned criminals of Norfolk, Virginia, declared that they had been the members of a pirate's crew that had captured the Patriot and had compelled all hands aboard to walk the plank. The men they mentioned especially the beautiful young lady. 
When Theodosia sailed from Georgetown, she carried with her an ordinary baggage, a portrait of herself, apparently a gift for her father, or was it for Meriwether Lewis? This portrait leads us to a final legend from the lonely dune country of the treacherous North Carolina coast. A woman living at Nags Head wrote in 1869, one bleak winter morning there drifted ashore here a small pilot boat with her sails set and her rudder tied down. Always alert for spoils from the sea, the people of the out islands watched with great curiosity the approach of this little vessel. They at last fetched out their small boats and headed offshore for the idly drifting pilot ship, apparently controlled by nothing but the waves and the wind. Their hailing, after the manner of those who live by the sea, brought no answer. Silence greeted the investigating party, not the silence of sleep or of ordinary quiet, but a stillness of death and disaster. As the investigators drew near the craft, their hearts were filled with superstitious awe, feeling that they were in the presence of a mystery. As some of the bolder ones of the company, armed to the teeth, boarded the strange craft with great caution, alert for sinister hidden dangers or for the mournful signs of some dreadful plague, but the whole ship was entirely deserted. A table in one of the cabins set for a meal remained undisturbed. There was no treasure in the way of gold or silver, but on the wall of one cabin hung a very beautiful portrait, and on a table in that room were an intricately carved chambered nautilus shell and a vase of wax flowers. There was also a number of very handsome silk dresses made in the empire style of long ago. When the tragic pathetic things about the vessel were divided, the portrait fell on to one John Tillett. The rest of the loot apparently consisted of nothing but kitchen utensils, dresses, shawls, and flowers. Tillich presented whatever fell to him to his fiancée, who soon became his wife. The men of this type were known as wreckers. We do not know if they were accustomed to demolish for the salvage of the lumber and equipment of the ships that were wrecked on the dangerous coast. In any event, what became of this vessel no one knows. Nor is there any record that she was actually named the Patriot. Since Theodosia sailed from Georgetown and down the long reach of the Winaya Bay on the night of December 30th, it seems rather strange that the little packet should have found her way as ocean travel was in those days, all the way up to Hatteras by the following day. The distance from Georgetown to Cape Hatteras is approximately 150 miles. John Tillett's widow, shortly after the demise of her first mate, married a Mr. Mann. When he died not long after his marriage, he left Mrs. Polly Mann practically destitute. She lived in the woods behind the dunes and the shack that she called home was furnished with the humblest rustic furniture. Although she had one real treasure, she probably did not know it. On a wall of the cabin hung the beautiful portrait of which her first husband, Mr. Tillett, had looted from this strange deserted vessel. The portrait, practically disregarded, hung there until 1869 for more than 50 years. Finally, Mrs. Mann, then very old, became quite ill. She was attended by Dr. William G. Poole of Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Noticing that Dr. Poole admired the painting and having no money to pay him for his services, Mrs. Mann gave it to him. He had no idea of its history or its identity, but he took it to his summer home at Nags Head, where for ten or twelve years it hung almost unnoticed. Done on polished mahogany, it is an oil painting about twenty inches long and a heavily gilded frame. It is about an it has about it an elegance that we associate with aristocracy. Of bust length, it shows a woman of wonderful black eyes and auburn hair. She wears a white bodice cut low at the neck, ornately adorned with the finest lace. The expression, although haughty and proud, is redeemed by a patrician beauty and elegance that justifies her expression of inescapable superiority. Without having any special meaning for him, this portrait hung in Dr. Poole's house for a good many years. It was about 80 years after Tillett gave it to his bride-to-be at the port that the portrait suddenly took on a dramatic significance. An artist on a summer trip to North Carolina coast saw the portrait, examined it scrupulously, and after studying it for a long time, pronounced it as a masterpiece. Unquestionably, he felt, it was a painting of a great person by a master artist. But aside from saying it represented a person of high aristocratic, aristocratic descent and that the artist had been a genius, he was unable to go any further. The subject and the painter remained a mystery. 
Not long after this, Dr. Poole chanced upon an article in an old magazine which went into the tragic history of the Burr family. Illustrating the article was a picture of Theodosia Burr. The doctor was electrified by the likeness of the painting that he owned to the picture in the magazine. Each had the same lustrous black eyes, the same beauty as and patrician air. As Mrs. Mann had told him how the painting had come into her possession, the doctor at once became convinced not only that he possessed an authentic portrait of the beautiful and beloved Theodosia, but he had probably solved the long mystery of her disappearance. He felt that the jet black penetrating eyes must be those of the lost daughter of Aaron Burr. Dr. Pooh was so stirred by what he believed to be this startling discovery that he mailed a photograph of the painting to a member of the Burr family. The reply was prompt and decisive. We identify the portrait as a likeness of Theodosia Burr Alston, who sailed to her death in a little pilot boat from Georgetown, South Carolina, on December 30th, 1812. Other members of the Burr family visited Dr. Poole's home on the coast and appeared to be convinced that this conjecture was true. Dr. Poole carried a photograph of the painting to Washington. There, Mrs. John Wheeler, the daughter of the celebrated artist Thomas Sully, who painted Queen Victoria, said unhesitatingly, It is exactly like the portrait in my possession. The, like the likeness of Theodosia, which was produced by Mrs. Wheeler, appeared identical with Dr. Poole's picture. Alas, poor Theodosia, this beautiful woman was undoubtedly drowned, but whether in a storm of off Hatteras or by the cruelty of pirates, no one will ever be certain. And that was, alas, Theodosia. <sighs> I actually didn't know that she died. I also haven't seen the musical. Does that make me a bad musical theater person? I do love musical theater, I just... I'm a bit out of the loop, I guess. This one is called The Witch Woman. Here, freshly told for this book, is a tale that over the generation has sent delightful shivers down the back of many another, many a young southerner. Told at night by a dying fire, this story of a witch can still exert a powerful spell. Well, we're going to see about that. One night long ago, a man rode up to a lonely cabin on the edge of a swamp. He was travel-weary and arch-achingly hungry, and he told himself, if I can just get me a hunk of corn, pone, and a slice of bacon, I don't care what I pay. At that, a handsome yellow woman came out of the cabin. Her eyes were soft and shiny, and she moved with the quick grace of a cat. Why don't you light up and come into the cabin and get some supper? She said hospitably. How that hungry man's mouth watered when he caught a glimpse of the well-filled skillet that she was cooking over the hot coals. He ate and he ate, and it was all so good that he stayed on at the cabin for days. He finally got so fat that the grease ran out of his jaws whenever he looked up at the sun. And that handsome yellow woman, why she spent all her time cooking for him and waiting on him. And so finally he just couldn't help himself. He married her. For a time they got along well, but after a while he began to notice something very curious about his wife, as if... He woke up in the middle of the night, as he sometimes did. She was never in the cabin. One day he decided he would spy on her and find out what was going on. That night he laid down as usual in the big four-poster bed in the corner and pretended that he had gone to sleep, but he was really watching his wife out of the corner of one eye. After a while, he pretended to snore. Then she jumped up and patted a juba dance in the middle of the floor. After that, she took a big gridiron down from the wall and raked it full of hot coals and hauled her spinning wheel over close to it. Then she sat down on the gridiron. When it had grown red hot, she began to spin her skin right off her body with the spinning wheel, starting at the top of her head, and as she did so, she sang, Turn and spin, come off skin, turn and spin, come off skin. As he watched, she spun her entire skin off, her body was as easy as the shucks of off an ear of corn. When it was all off, she was revealed as an enormous, tawny yellow cat. She took the skin and tucked it under the bed. Lay there, skin, she told it. With that fool husband of mine snoring none to bed, until I come back, I'm going to have me some fun. The great cat, the great cat leaped through the window and loped off into the night. As soon as she was gone, the man jumped out of bed, took the skin, and filled it full of salt and pepper. 
for now he knew that he had married a wretched witch woman. He put the skin back under the bed, and then he crept out back and watched through the keyhole. After a while, the witch woman came home, still a cat. She laughed as she pulled out the skin and began shaking herself into it. Suddenly, the salt and pepper burned her, and her laugh became a scream. She moaned and groaned so you could hear a mile away, but she wasn't able to get out of the skin. And while the man watched through the keyhole, she finally fell down on the floor and died. And that was the Witch Woman. I want to show you this artwork because it is terrifying. So if you don't want to see something kind of scary, don't look. But it's really cool. See? See, I always feel bad for witches in these stories because she literally didn't do anything wrong other than go be a cat somewhere, you know? Like, what did she do? She just was a cat. She took off her skin. She's just a little weird. Her husband's not very accepting. I, I disapprove. Um, next, we have Joe John, Carpen Joe John and the Carpenter. There we go. The writer of this story, Manly Wade Wellman, says that he, it was told to him in 1951 by an old bee hunter named Green, who lived near Bat Cave in Henderson County, North Carolina. You'll find Mr. Joe Collins' place up the winding hill road yonder, with fields terraced upslope growing good-looking corn and nice stock in Mr. Joe John's barns and pens, and he'd feed hungry neighbor or tend any sick one. All that sorrowed him, this day I mention, was his little boy Anzi, crippled ever since he fell off the wagon and had run over both his legs. That noon, a stranger man tramped into sight up the road curb and stopped at Mr. Joe Johnson's mailbox. Wonder if there might be a job work for me, he said. I'm a carpenter. And he showed the tool kit he carried. Between the two, Mr. Joe John liked the books of the carpenter and had said, Yes, come across the yard. See that neighbor house yonder? Between the two houses run a footpath, but midway across was dug a deep ditch with water running down from above. Me and that neighbor man was like two brothers once, said Mr. Joe John. Then we fell out over a piece of land and he dug that ditch to show he don't want me coming on over to his place. Now I'll go do him one better. I want you to take these planks and poles and build me a board fence along the side of the ditch so he can't even see me over here. The carpenter studied. Then he allowed, I can do something you like. All right, now I'm going to the upper field to chop weeds. See you later. Mr. Joe John went, and the carpenter set to work. Like any lone working man, he started to sing. Not a silly song, not a, nor a purely funny one, but you felt good to hear it, or I reckon to sing it. In Mr. Joe John's house, little Anzi heard, and got off the couch and took his crutches and began to inch out there, his poor swunk up little legs. And when he got to where the carpenter was working, little Anzi smiled, and the carpenter smiled back at him. All that day the carpenter worked and talked to little Anzi, and when he finished, he went back to the house, and there came Mr. Joe John. All finished? he asked the carpenter. Yes, the carpenter replied to him. Come and see. And Mr. Joe John went to look, and gentlemen, that carpenter hadn't built any fence at all. He'd used up and used that lumber to make a footbridge over the ditch, and across the bridge come walking the neighbor with his hand stuck out. Joe John, he said, you don't know how doggone sorry I was that I dug that ditch, but now you build this bridge, Joe John, to show you never favored us being cut off. Mr. Joe John shook his old friend's hand. Why, he said, I'm just as pleased as you are, but don't credit me with the bridge notion. This carpenter here, he thought it up. They both looked around. The carpenter had hoisted up his toolkit ready to leave. He smiled at them. Then, before he was gone, he put his free hand on little Anzi's head just half a second. He said, throw away those crutches. Little Anzi flung them away, and fast as any boy ever ran, he run to his daddy. Next moment, next moment, the carpenter wasn't there. What? What? A magical, a magical carpenter that, oh, is this a Jesus story? No, he was the son of a carpenter. Um, wow, I love that. Oh, yay. What a good little story. Oh, see, okay. I like stories like that. 
stories of forgiveness and reaching out a hand. Because sometimes all it takes is one person to trust someone else and then things just kind of work out. Because the thing with human beings, the thing with any, any being, is that if you don't trust one another, then the cycle of distrust just keeps going. You need someone to trust in order for things to work, in order for things to keep going. If human beings trusted each other more in this world, I think we'd see a lot less heartbreak. I think we'd see a lot less pain. I think we'd see a more caring and giving and accepting and loving society. And it all starts with trust and believing in other people and giving them a chance. Next we have Joe Baldwin's life. John Hardin, who wrote this account of a famous North Carolina mystery, labels the whole affair as just a ghost story. Yet, they're a veteran railroad men who swear they have not only seen conductor Joe Baldwin's light, but have known trains to stop for it. The Mako Station ghost light goes back to 1867, the story of Joe Baldwin. In that year, a section of what is now the Atlantic Coastline Railroad was rebuilt to include, among other things, a station called Mako. This station's point had previously been known as Farmer's Turnout. Joe Bolden was a conductor on one of the ancient trains drawn by wood-burning engines. It made regular runs from west to Wilmington at the sea, touching Mako and other points along the line. In that primitive er era of railroading, cars were joined by pins and couplers. Joe Baldwin, riding his train one night on a rear coach, suddenly realized that it had become, become uncoupled. Another train was following. And Joe Baldwin's immediate fear was that this second train would plow into the free car before his distress would be noted or remedied. He therefore hurried to the near platform of the wild coach and saw the approaching headlight of the second train. He seized a signal lantern and started waving it frantically from the coach's platform. But the fast-moving train closed in rapidly on the slow-moving coach, which had lost its motive power and was coasting to a stop. The engineer on the approaching train, paying no heed to the frantic signals of Joe Baldwin, apparently had not yet seen what was ahead. But Joe stuck to his post and to his signaling, swinging the lantern more and more furiously. The train plunged on. Finally, with a great crash, it rocketed into the wild coach, completely demolishing it. In the terrific impact, conductor Joe Baldwin was decapitated. A witness at the wreck recalled that in the meeting of the engine and the free car, Joe Baldwin's lantern was waved until the last second and then was somehow hurled meteor-like away from the tracks. It fell in an adjacent swamp some distance away from the wreckage, rolled to an upright position, sputtered, caught up again, and continued to sit there and burn brightly until it was picked up and moved. Shortly after this fatal accident, a mysterious light began to appear on the coastline tracks in the Mako section. It had been appearing there over the years ever since. In fact, it has become quite a fad for parties to make night excursions to the Mako station to see this weird light come swinging down the tracks, only to disappear when anyone gets close to it. The ghostly performance has afforded midnight thrills to many hundreds. Summertime, the popular season for paying at the Mako station, light a visit, dark and moonless nights are better because they afford a clearer, sharper view of the light. Cars can be parked off the highway near a country store, and then the ghost party can walk hundred yards or so down a lonely road toward the railroad tracks. The cheerful and hilarious voices of such a party are likely to drop off into whispers at the stage of the expedition. It is usually somewhat silent group that climbs stealthily up the cindered path to await the, dis the appearance of the phenomenal light. And then the light appears. It will show itself at intervals of fifteen minutes or so. And as the watchers stand there in the night trying to dope the thing out, they are sure to recall the story of how conductor Joe Baldwin, waving his lantern desperately at approaching train, lost his head and his life on that very spot. From a vantage point, the light is first seen at some distance down the track, maybe a mile away. It starts with a flicker over the left rail, 
very much as if someone had struck a match. Then it glows a little brighter and begins creeping up the track toward you. As it becomes brighter, it increases in momentum. Then it dashes forward with a rather incredible velocity at the same time, swinging faster from side to side. Finally, it comes to a sudden halt some 75 yards away, glows there like a fiery eye, and speeds backward down the track as if retreating from some unseen danger. It stops where it's made its first appearance, hangs there ominously for a moment, like a moon in miniature, and then vanishes into nothingness. That is a usual pattern of the appearance, although different people always report seeing the thing in a slightly different form and fashion. The light appears over and over again, weather and seasons seem to have no influence on its visibility. It has been known to vanish for a month at a time, only to reappear several nights in rapid succession. Stories that deal with Joe Baldwin's nocturnal trips in search of his head include one that dates back to 1873. In that particular year, railroad men say a second light appeared, and the two lights shining with the brightness of a 25-watt electric bulb, as estimated later, would meet one another from opposite directions. It took an earthquake to stop Joe Baldwin's nightly jaunt, and then only temporarily. For a short time after the quake of 1886, the two lights disappeared. Soon, however, a single light reappeared, weaving silently along the tracks near Mako Station. Folks knew then that Joe Baldwin was again looking for his head. In 1889, the train bearing Grover Cleveland, President of the United States, paused near Mako Station after dark to take on wood and water. This predated the Atlantic Coastline, and the road was then the Wilmington, Manchester, and the Augusta Line. The night was balmy, and President Cleveland alighted from his special coach to take a stroll along the tracks. While walking along, he saw a, sing a train signalman with two lanterns, one red and the other green. "'Tell me,' said the President, "'what is the purpose of carrying two signal lanterns?' Before the presidential train started rolling toward Wilmington again, President Cleveland had the full story of Joe Baldwin's ghost light. He also found that the two lanterns were used at Mako Station so that engineers would not be deceived by the ghostly weaving of the Joe Baldwin light. Many explanations of this strange phenomenon have been suggested over the years. The most plausible is that the light comes from automobile headlights as cars pass somewhere in the vicinity and are either seen along the line of vision just across the top of the railroad track or are reflected in some way by steel rails or something else. But several things tend to disprove this explanation and to explode the theory behind it. The light was appearing before automobiles were in use, before the paved highways in the region existed. Also, roads have been rerouted several times with no apparent effect on the light. And some years ago, an interested group arranged to close temporarily all roads and highways from some distance from Mako, and for more than an hour one midnight, no automobile traffic was near or to enter the area. But the unearthly light danced and swung and bobbed up and down the track just the same. Men with scientific training have tackled the problem. People in the Mako community will tell you, but no one has ever come forward with an explanation that stands. A Washington, D.C. investigator paid a visit to Mako to explain things scientifically, but Joe was too fast for him. The scientist said, however, that he had seen enough to convince him that the light was no ignis fatuus, as he had sought to establish. Others have said that the light comes from a phosphorescent formation, but at the same time they tell you that what they know about this type of illumination does not indicate that it races up and down in a limited area. The Mako light never varies a fraction from a given course. There are the scene of the one-time railroad wreck. It always appears about three feet above the left rail, facing east. Always. The people of New Hanover and Brunswick counties are not among those who seek explanations. They dismiss unbelievers, and the entire matter, by saying it's Joe Baldwin's light, that Joe is still swinging his eerie lantern and looking for his head. And some observers claim that they have been close enough to the light to see the guards that are a part of the lantern construction. And that was Joe Baldwin's light ghost stories. There's something so interesting about ghost stories. Though it is kind of sad, if you truly believe in an afterlife, that someone's soul could be trapped in this plane, constantly repeating the same mission over and over and over again. 
I wonder if they even realize it. This one's called, It's a Long Time Between Drinks. Everybody knows what the governor of North Carolina said to the governor of South Carolina, but when and where and on what occasion did he say it? Here is one account from Carl Gorsh's Down Home. This version has been handed down the family of John Motley Moorhead, minister of Sweden, who died in 1933. His grandfather was governor of North Carolina from 1841 to 1845. During that same time, J.H. Hammond was governor of South Carolina. Moorhead, a Whig, and Hammond was a Democrat. The two governors had a lengthy correspondence relative to the extradition of a political offender, a South, Car a South Carolinian, a South Carolinian, who was being held in North Carolina. Governor Moorhead refused to turn the man over to South Carolina officers. Correspondence failed to bring out an agreement, so the governors decided to meet near the state line and talk over the matter. Accompanied by their staffs and legal advisors, the conference took place. Neither governor got very far with his argument, and the discussion became quite heated as it progressed. Finally, Governor Hammond lost his temper. He told Governor Moorhead that unless the prisoner was released, he would send a military force into North Carolina and seize the fugitive. Now, sir, he shouted as he crashed his fish fist upon the table. What is your answer to that? Governor Moorhead regarded him somewhat quizzically. Then he spoke up and said, My answer to that, sir, is that it's a damn long time between drinks. The answer was so unexpected that Governor Hammond was unable to say anything for a moment. Then he burst out into laughter, which was joined by everybody else in the room. The tension was relieved and drinks were passed around. Afterwards, the two governors continued their conference and succeeded in reaching an agreement satisfactory to both. And that's what good humor will get you. That was, it's a long time between drinks. I've never heard of that before. I guess maybe in the South it's a popular story. Um, and I suppose the moral we can learn from that is... It's important to remember that we're all still human. I mean, not me, but you know, you. When tensions get high and things seem dire, it's important to remember that the stakes are only as high as we make them. Truly, really. And if you take a step back and you refocus, you realize there's really no reason to get upset at all. It's easier said than done in the heat of the moment, but self-reflection is important. Anyway. That was the end of section two of this chapter of the Southerners in this book of American folklore. Next is going to be the final section, and then we will move on to something else. And this something else is going to be very good, I can tell. I don't know what it is. I think it's the Westerners. I'm not sure. But thank you so much for joining me for another story time with Sid. I appreciate you showing up every week, and if this is your first time, hi, glad you're here. And if you don't ever come back again, I'm glad you're here now. Thank you for staying until the end. And I hope you're all staying happy, healthy, and safe. Thank you so much. I'll see you next week.